Harnessing nuclear reactions to drive a vehicle through space. This is Nuclear Pulse Propulsion, a division of spacecraft engines designed for exploring the outer planets and beyond. In part two of our series on Nuclear Pulse Propulsion and Project Orion, we're elaborating on mechanical systems, the function of the proposed Orion configurations, and the operation and use cases for nuclear pulses in both propulsion and mission-related tasks. The Electronic System Design Alliance, or ESDA, describes itself as the premier conference for design and automation of electronic systems. It is the largest and most influential global conference concerned with automation and electrical systems in emerging technology fields. This organization publishes lecture notes for study. In their 2019 published proceedings, titled Energy Systems, Drives, and Automations, there is a discussion of commercial nuclear engines. The advantages of using nuclear fuel, shared across nuclear pulse and nuclear thermal engines, are pointed out in three main points by the paper's author. We'll break down each in the context of the nuclear pulse engine, but note these benefits extend to all types of nuclear fuels. In this analysis, the author's conclusion is then made. Nuclear fission will lead us to an era of marvelous scientific advancement, which might even open doors to a new division of science unexplored by us. What does this phrase mean, a new division of science, and why proclaim the fruits of fission are not yet grasped, our civilization being decades into an established legacy of nuclear energy? This quote is just one example of nuclear propulsion's ignored legacy appearing on the surface of science as it has repeatedly since it was imagined. Considerations of space missions using nuclear propulsion occur at the highest levels, appearing decade after decade in proposals heavily considered by NASA and ESA, in missions ranging from Mars to the outer planets. Today, nuclear thermal engines, such as those produced by NERVA programs, are highly desired by space agencies for missions to Mars and beyond, but financial and political pressures continually present setbacks for nuclear engines of all design. Orion represents the foundation of this unexplored division of science, where thermonuclear fusion will allow humans to achieve agency in the interplay of our solar system. Nuclear propulsion allows us to accomplish feats that would require orders of magnitude more time, money, energy, and precious resources using legacy rockets. Not only is it a practical engine, the NPP system has the unique ability to act as a rapid means to project human influence into space. While other vehicles must either carry a power source or a converter with limited efficiency, nuclear engines generate easily harnessed energies. Recent innovations allow for direct conversion of radiation as well. More on this soon. In the case of a basic nuclear thermal engine, tapping into a fraction of the available energy is as simple as running some piping through what is essentially an open nuclear reactor. Early NERVA nuclear engines are examples of this approach. Propulsion gases are heated by the reactor and expand as exhaust to produce thrust. While these types of nuclear engines are much more efficient than chemical rockets, they suffer from the same material limitations. A nuclear pulse engine is exposed to tens of thousands of Kelvin in the nuclear blast, but the pulsed nature of this system avoids the complexity of active cooling and a thrust throttling system. Exposure to the blast occurs over about one millisecond, and the ablation of the pusher plate is minimal. Photon pressure, predominantly in the form of X-rays and intense thermal radiation, are among the useful products. Using modern methods, the energy provided can be converted efficiently and does not rely on a transmission medium for usage. This absence of a conversion media is what defines these processes as direct conversion. Nuclear engines can also produce useful chemical and radiological products from their operation, although public experimentation in this area is limited. In the case of NPP specifically, the system can be used to produce neutrons and elemental plasma of specific composition at near relativistic velocities. We will discuss many use cases later, but for now entertain that nuclear pulses can be used for a wide range of scientific and industrial tasks on and outside the vehicle, as well as performing support activities for other vehicles and installations in space. Within nuclear pulse propulsion concepts, external pulses using self-detonating devices are only a small subset of many potential designs. They are the most versatile design by far for large vehicles, with the other designs carrying stricter limits on vehicle size at the cost of efficiency. Larger, more efficient pulse-propelled devices might use a flexible plastic sheet suspended by a magnetic field to drive the vehicle. At these scales, modern research suggests laser-triggered fusion pellets would be used, not the self-detonating devices used by Orion. Vehicles using laser-triggered fusion in smaller internal and external engines fall under the name Sirius in common parlance. 
although any government work done on the serious concepts after 1970 appears to remain classified today. Any public or commercial research into laser fusion technology is likely being conducted with little publicity, representing a serious economic investment. An early point of contention over NPP is the implication of using nuclear devices to begin movement from Earth. In initial plans, a tall launch stand would be needed to compress the pusher plate just before launch to ensure proper motion during takeoff. This issue highlights that when using NPP thrust, it is not throttleable below a certain threshold. The larger vehicles conceived under Project Orion might have incurred damage to a launch site if ground launched. The recoil mechanism presents several problems, introducing a risk factor should the detonation of the devices not match up with the resting position of the pusher plate. In the original Orion, the motion of the pusher plate was completely determined by the nuclear detonations. Planned missions using this design contemplated starting the pusher plate in its compressed position and using low-yield, non-nuclear devices in order to start the pulse sequence. This introduces complexity to the launch, which has obvious drawbacks. We have a more elegant option available to us today using electrical alternators. This is a simple reciprocating generator using the motion of the pusher plate to produce electrical current. When this technology is applied, the vehicle is known as a mechanized or motorized Orion. By reversing the flow of electricity to the alternator, we can power the pusher's movements and permit unlimited engine restarts, as well as being able to slow the plate's reciprocation and gradually make acceleration changes. You could impart a slight initial movement to the plate to finely trim maneuvers. This development is a huge deal for NPP since it means erroneous or mistimed detonations can be easily accounted for and introduce little additional complexity. Not only a safety and maneuvering feature, a mechanized Orion's pusher plate can even serve as a hasty landing foot if required, capable of performing hops on low-gravity bodies or producing pneumatic pressure for mining and construction activity. Throughout the 1950s and 60s, an effort to develop a variety of nuclear storage and conversion techniques was organized by laboratories around the world, under the name Systems for Nuclear Auxiliary Power or SNAP. This development was groundbreaking, exploring engineering and material development for nuclear turbines, nuclear batteries, and reactor plumbing. This research differed from conventional nuclear reactor development also occurring at this time. SNAP systems were designed to be deployed on spacecraft and had to tolerate launch, re-entry, and other considerations of application in space. Most of this space-specific work was conducted at the North American Aviation Division of Atomics International Incorporated, although other labs such as Jet Propulsion Labs of Pasadena and Los Alamos National Lab produced related work. Many of the applied studies were carried out by the Army Signal Research Corps and the United States Air Force. Specifically, the field of thermionics was put under intense scientific scrutiny and several methods of deriving nuclear power from radiation sources were considered. This work is relevant to our discussions since it included considerations of direct conversion of nuclear energy. Direct energy conversion and SNAP research provided the means for many nuclear devices being used on modern space vehicles, and the role of these technologies has always been associated with Orion. The ultimate ambition of these projects was to transform legacy nuclear reactors into solid-state electricity generators with no cooling systems or moving parts, technology we have begun to realize today. Nuclear fission devices produce fission products, or radionuclides, known as fallout. The preliminary Orion concept called for World War II-era nuclear weapons, but this quickly evolved to leverage the increased efficiency of the hydrogen bomb, then called the super. By using a small fission tamper to initiate a larger fusion reaction, a thermonuclear device can achieve much greater power output with negligible environmental contamination. This is all done using low-enriched uranium, meaning the handling and production as well as the political concerns surrounding highly enriched uranium can be avoided. Let's consider the drawbacks which emerged from Orion bomblet designs. Using pure fission devices poses significant problems. They are more expensive, they are damaging to Earth's atmospheric environment, and can produce radiation belts in unnatural locations in its magnetic field, they pose a long-term risk in the environment of solar space, where some magnetic regions are prone to receiving their radiation, and all of these problems go to show that the ultimate direction of the Orion program to adopt thermonuclear devices was definitely the way to go. However, there may be situations where fission is needed. Pure fission devices can be smaller and simpler in design. They produce fewer neutrons than most fusion devices and require less propellant material since more of the fission product mass can be used as propellant. 
Whether we use pure fission or thermonuclear fusion, the environmental concerns are mostly considering atmospheric pollution. Once in space, the radioactive products are released at near-relativistic velocity and will usually leave the solar system. But after continual use, contamination of planetary magnetic fields could become a problem. Orion is inherently inefficient, and inefficiency results in more energy dumped into the environment. This is a sacrifice for an extremely high specific impulse and thrust-to-weight ratio. We should acknowledge that nuclear fusion reactions may be either neutronic or aneutronic. Thus, depending on the fusion fuels used, a neutron flux can be produced. While generating neutrons so close to the vehicle would appear to be undesirable, we'll discuss later how these neutrons can be converted into power by the vehicle. George Dyson has emphasized the application of nuclear hydrodynamics. When his father, Freeman Dyson, worked on the Orion project, nuclear dynamics were a closely guarded secret. The term we use today, nuclear hydrodynamics, was a new field of science in Dyson's era. This research was specifically concerned with the interaction of a developing nuclear shock front within the atmosphere. The characteristics of these blasts could be changed by altering the design of the device or the timing of the nuclear detonation. In the absence of an atmosphere, filler and propellant mast must be used to produce these effects. The hydrodynamic pulses produced by asymmetrical nuclear devices can be used in numerous applications. For our purposes, pulse device applications will fall into one or more of three categories. The standard use case for devices is propulsion. These vary in power output and can be operated in different modes to prevent the production of radionuclides or fallout in atmosphere. The directed plasma created by pulses has even been theorized as a means to launch raw material between planets, as a paper published in the Journal of the British Interplanetary Society postulates. Pulse devices can output radiation in specific ranges and at set intensities, with a variable cone of effect. The devices can be made to detonate in distinct ways using digital control. For example, a pulse can be made to send radiation, but not plasma, in all directions. Or more plasma can be produced in all directions with a directional or omnidirectional X-ray radiation. Another option is for a fine beam of plasma and radiation with a dispersion of only a few percents of a degree, akin to a traditional explosive-shaped charge. While there are numerous useful applications for small nuclear devices, these are ultimately finite. The pulse device's operation can be influenced by the detonation sequence or by physical design. The mechanisms which determine the device's performance are numerous enough to offer a huge range of possibilities even though configurations are limited. The most obvious and certain use of a pulse device to gather data could be a flashlight of a specific spectra. A single detonation could illuminate the face of a planet, allowing for planetary ground-penetrating mapping. Crucially, the pulse system allows for science to be conducted at long ranges. In general terms, an NPP vehicle could perform intensive study on a body from a Lagrange point instead of an orbit. Radiation-focusing equipment outside the vehicle could alter the pulse's spectrum of emissions or produce a specific ionized plasma. In a simpler exercise, one could paint a thick layer of rubberized paint containing specific elements onto a pulse device to produce a plasma of those elements during detonation. While inefficient, the concept has basis in real experiments. The vehicle can also employ its nuclear pulses to indirectly support scientific activity, providing a high-energy radiation source for other installations to gather imaging or emission data. An Orion might detonate a device pointed at the atmosphere of a planet with an optical array far in the distance to receive the radiation. Using this method, highly accurate readings of dense planetary atmospheres could be produced. The NPP vehicle can loiter nearby active science or industrial operations and provide specific services using its propulsion system. There are more possibilities here than I could imagine, but several ideas have already been conceptually validated. Demolition pulses for excavation, producing low radiation, low plasma, and high equivalent tonnage in TNT force, have an obvious function, to excavate large areas with minimal debris and excess energy. Thermal glassing pulses for fusing regolith into a hard foundation using the photothermal effect, producing high radiation in the ultraviolet slash x-ray spectrum, low plasma, and a low equivalent tonnage in TNT force, could also be used. These would likely be used in tandem with the boring pulses for excavating self-supporting shafts into surfaces. 
The high amount of thermal heat imparted over multiple pulses results in hardening of the local material to a limited depth. The exact composition of the pulses would differ depending on the target material, likely being either partially hydrated regolith or frozen ices. Plasma pulses could paint a surface with a wave of isotopes carrying a specific range of energy, allowing for surface preparation, chemical production, and terrain surveying. These would need low radiation, high plasma, and a low equivalent tonnage in TNT. Imaging pulses could permeate a smaller body such as an asteroid and map its interior, using a high radiation and the high frequency X-ray and gamma ray spectrum, with low plasma and a low equivalent tonnage in TNT force produced. Forming pulses for use in explosively formed habitat structures is also an attractive idea. The microgravity vacuum of space is an ideal place for forming molten metals. Using a process of explosively forming a metal slug over repeated pulses until it is in a desired dome or sheet shape could allow rapid construction of vehicle shells and habitats in orbit. An NPP vehicle could manage these single-piece metalworking operations and then carry the final products down to the planet's surface. Other materials, such as dense thermoplastic coated with graphite to block radiation, could be used for transparent or translucent parts of the dome. I am interested in modeling this concept to see how precise the distribution of force needs to be and how large and thin such a structure could feasibly become using only this nuclear deformation. Experiments with explosive deformation of materials using chemical explosives is well understood, particularly in the context of manufacturing and military application. These techniques readily translate into nuclear devices. However, utilizing explosive deformation in a vacuum will present new resolvable challenges. Nuclear processing pulses for procuring fissile material in situ were considered during the Orion project. Ted Taylor developed a concept to provide easy access to useful nuclear material on bodies with a source of water ice. By boring a long vertical shaft into the ice and dropping a thermonuclear device into it, an underground cavity is formed with a pool of radioactive elements at the bottom. In a low-gravity environment, inert gas could be used to siphon this material, further simplifying extraction. In a near-microgravity environment, these products could be floated and then pumped to the surface using thickened or superheated fluids. As we've illustrated, these devices fulfill many functions, and most effects are accomplished with minor or no changes to the physical construction of the devices. A small reserve of devices with specific utility are kept aboard the vehicle as dictated by the mission, while others can be modified on the fly to meet demand. A NPP vehicle represents a more elegant solution to the tricky question of bringing potentially deadly devices into space for utility tasks such as demolition, protection against debris, or as a mining tool. A NPP can economically accomplish all of these things using its propulsion system, so you can achieve protection against natural threats without implications of managing a weapon system and storing ammunition in space, something we should avoid if possible. This opens possibilities for entirely civilian crews on NPP craft. It's worth mentioning that the destructive material of propulsion devices is extremely low. They are designed for specific energies which are magnitudes lesser in comparison to military devices of equal mass. Weaponizing these systems is a largely pointless venture, and this is illustrated by the USAF's own admission that the Orion was not a justifiable military project, being unattractive in almost every regard compared to other delivery methods. Not only does an NPP vehicle have powerful maneuvering, scientific, and manufacturing tool sets at its disposal, but it can operate them with impunity should the need arise in an emergency. Missions can be extended if timelines need to be reassessed, and more stops can be added while on mission without additional refueling or supply. With the ability to synthesize chemicals at interplanetary distances, produce hydrodynamic pressure at will in the vacuum of space, or produce clouds of ionized gas remotely at orbital distances, and perhaps even through thin atmospheres, the NPP craft is an extremely powerful scientific tool. It does not need to undergo modification to accomplish this variety of tasks either. The possibilities here remain unexplored and are limited only by human ingenuity. We rarely find specific details about using nuclear pulses for applications such as these in the historical literature. But we do know the multipurpose quality of nuclear pulses was recognized and discussed from early in Project Orion's life. Later, as a computerized simulation model led to the extremely configurable nuclear devices we know today, the possibilities have expanded with the pulse devices now capable of fulfilling a wide range of non-propulsion services for the spacecraft and mission. 
Having discussed the details of the nuclear pulse devices, we'll move on to technologies we can apply to the NPP vehicle itself. Early in development, the use of magnetic fields to aid in propulsion of Orion was considered. A strong field around the craft or the pusher plate could decelerate a larger amount of propellant gases, increasing momentum transfer to the vehicle. There are questions as to how realistic producing sufficient magnetic fields will be. Scientists evaluating the concept believed that, that the concentration of plasma could create a magnetic pinch close to the pusher plate. This would compress the magnetic fields and greatly reduce the amount of electrical energy needed. Full-scale experimentation would be necessary to confirm this process. The ability to produce such a field would of course have numerous scientific and safety applications. We mentioned earlier that nuclear energy can be transformed into usable energy by the spacecraft. Specifically, we mentioned SNAP, the legacy research project exploring energy conversion for spacecraft. In the past, nuclear batteries or radioisotope generators generated power from fission material. These designs are inherently limited by thermal limitations. There are new alternatives today to these devices. Nanoheterostructures are advanced materials made from networks of nanostructures and perform the task of converting nuclear energy within a solid-state format. These structures run cool, requiring little or no active cooling. By using tested nanomaterial direct energy conversion methods, harnessed energy densities can be raised over three orders of magnitude over conventional nuclear reactors. There are two types we are concerned with. CICI nanostructures, these convert electrical power directly from particle beams while also blocking radiation. This system boasts usability as a method for communication or power transmission using particle beams. CICI structures are essentially supercapacitors charged using nuclear energy and discharging electricity. Sir Lick Met or ceramic liquid metal microstructures can produce active fission products while producing short but very high power outputs at energy densities necessary to produce modulated neutrino emissions. NPP vehicles equipped with a nanohetero Sir Lick Met array have access to modulated neutrino emissions powerful enough to transmit ultra high bandwidth data across interplanetary distances or through planets. Nanohetero materials are also used for superfast breeding of nuclear materials. A NPP or a surface base being supported by one could produce thorium fuel in cycles of just seven days, assuming similar production methods as are used on Earth. An entire fleet of NPP introduces a new paradigm for mission planning and risk management. Because vehicles can support one another at distance by expending fuel in a variety of ways, missions become easier with more vehicles available in the solar system. While traditional spacecraft often work in local tandem, this is generally to provide line-of-sight communication and mission-specific functions, such as sky crane or mother craft. NPP vehicles can aid missions at astronomical distances and perform rescue and recovery operations at will. The paradigm extant in space programs today, where the mission planning and control occurs at Earth, can be improved upon with the adoption of NPP fleets. A single NPP vehicle can provide the computational and transmission bandwidth necessary for mission planning, can carry crew only lightly trained for space activities such as researchers and administrative staff, and can directly contribute to each mission with its own hardware if needed. It's realistic to imagine a fleet of a dozen NPP vehicles or less operating with a constant line of sight with one or more command vehicles, located at strategic points in the inner and outer solar system. Compared to currently hypothetical technological advents, such as solar sails, laser propulsion, or ion engines, Orion and NPP is capable of changing our situation more drastically and contains much less uncertainty and financial risk over those examples. We shouldn't downplay any technology, but the notable difference here is that while many of its competitors are still not a viable technology for manned exploration, NPP has been viable since 1963 at least. Even though institutional interest in Project Orion has become sequestered and stagnant, numerous facets of nuclear science being developed today hint at the possibilities unlocked by nuclear energy.